Great, I think that's working. Um, hi everybody, this is Jojo Hogan from Slow Post Part, I'm here and today I feel so lucky and privileged to be sitting on the sofa with my dear friend Jenny Allison who um, is a wonderful and amazing Auckland based acupuncturist and uh, has written the most beautiful book um, one of the most important books I feel on the postpartum and that book is using the notes, that book is this book and this is the golden month caring for the world's mothers after childbirth so um, I heard of Jenny I think we were talking about it last night mm. I heard of Jenny from your daughter Fran it was mm. quite a few years ago I was teaching Fran as uh, a, a, in a pregnancy massage at the college here in Auckland and she mentioned her mum she said oh I need to put you in touch with because I was expounding passionately about the postpartum and she said to me oh I've got to introduce you to my mum she's a, a, an acupuncturist who works in the local area and she's also passionate about the things that you are and I think it took a little while for Jenny and I to touch base yeah. but when we but did when we did <laughs> we had a lot to talk about eh? a lot to talk about yeah. Um, so today we're getting together to have a little chat about our, our um, passion of, of the mm. postpartum mm. and I'd love Jenny to talk to you a little bit about her book The Golden Month and hear a, a little bit about her story and her journey to um, helping and supporting postpartum women around the world. Is that okay? Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So tell yeah. me Jen. First of all, thank you. Oh, it's, it's, I feel really grateful too for this conversation with you and your incredible commitment to the work and and your passion mm. and your relationships with the women that are so helpful. Oh, it's so wonderful to have a, a friend, you know, in, in the same place that is yeah. that we have the same common, you know, interests and passion. So, yeah. tell me, when did your interest in working with pregnant and postpartum women start? I think it started when I was studying in college for my Chinese medicine acupuncture um, degree yeah. and um, I thought oh my goodness this is very interesting stuff I will practice it when I have my children and I finished and immediately started to have my family yeah. and although we were taught kind of the bare bones I remember thinking look these, the, the bare bones uh, 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 they make a lot of sense and so I said to my mother um, mum come please I was in Sydney she said yes of course and so I had this amazing experience because my partner was in China and I was on my own and my mother was there for six weeks wow. um, and basically she set us up for a, a very happy first year and just because of the work she did and, and for us in the postpartum. So you were so, so lucky because you, you had that knowledge that you would need, need that care. Eh? Yeah. That's what you know. so many of us didn't have before having the baby. Yeah. We didn't realise how much care would we, we would need personally, but you well, knew I that. I had the bare bones, but, yeah. but the bare bones were enough. I mean, my mother didn't know about massage. She didn't know about special food, yeah. but she gave me this, like a, a supportive container. Yeah. For me to express myself when I needed to, um, to hold everyone else around so that they did all the work and I did nothing, yeah. and to just give me emotional support when I needed Which it. Which is so, 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 so much crucial. crucial. Yeah, that, that's really crucial. Yeah. Oh, how wonderful. So then, once you knew the benefits of being yes. cared for postpartum, then you were able to go out in there into the world and share yeah. those with your clients. Well, I started. Well, I started to talk to, to women from other cultures and. And my mother-in-law is an amazing matriarch in Mali. She told me about what they do, which is called the 40 days. And when I heard and saw the similarities, I thought, oh my goodness, we're really onto something and this is wisdom that's been lost. That's right. That, and that's the fascinating thing I find is that um, when I started learning about postpartum as well um, and learning from my teacher, Julia Jones, about the fact that the, the first 40 days is a, the common um, theme through all the different cultures. Yeah, eh? yeah. The sitting moon, the golden month, but always it's that first 40 days, that 30 to 40 days, depending on mm, which culture you yeah. come from. Yeah. There's that really intensive, focused care of the mother. You know, the baby is 
it's often doesn't have anything to do with the baby and there's certain baby care activities that are going on and baby massage and but actually the real focus of the care is on the baby uh, sorry on the mother because that mm. understanding that if the mother is cared for and loved and nurtured Absolutely. and nourished then yeah. the baby's going to be fine right because the mother Absolutely. can look after the baby yeah it's the mothership yeah. um and in chinese medicine we talk about the energies of earth which mothership is, i love that <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we talk about the energies of earth and that is really about um, that ability to hold and be centered and to give yes. which is what mother earth does yes. but we're activating our earth energy when we become mothers and we need to be we need first of all we need to learn how to nurture ourselves by accepting good care yes and we'll go yes. back to that in a moment because that is sometimes one of the hardest things yeah. for our Especially modern mothers yeah. yeah but um but also just the fact of someone caring for us fills fills up our cup. Fills, fills up, up our, our cup. cup, and then yeah. when our cup is full and, and overflowing, we yeah. then we've got enough to give. Yeah. And our cup needs to be full, not just emotionally but physically as well. Absolutely. We need to be rejuvenated from yeah. the incredible um, effort that we've just done. Uh, we need to. It's be like a marathon. Yes, absolutely. it's more. It's because more we, because then we don't get to sleep. At night, yes, we have broken nights, and we're lactating for and, most of us. Yeah. Right, and well, and also we've been pregnant for nine months. We've yes. just grown the baby as yes. well as birthed the baby. So it's more, much more than a marathon. Much actually. more, and yeah. there's no other. And then sometimes we've had um, a surgery as well, a major mm. abdominal surgery, mm. and it's the only time that you're ever expected to expend that much physical energy, and then you're given a t- job that's twenty four seven on call. Yeah, so and it's. One of the most demanding things you will ever do. Yes, yeah. yes. And why isn't that isn't that respected in our culture? It's mm-hmm. understood in all these other cultures, isn't it? It's understood, and even more than that, it's like a whole version of the postpartum that's seen as not just allowing the mother to recover, but celebrating. Yes, so, yes. So there's a lot of happiness around because the whole family comes together, and in many cultures, there's allotted tasks that, that members of the family will have. And it's very prescribed, so it's it's like a very safe container because everyone knows and expects, yeah, you know, knows what what, what, what they're going to do, is. and the mother expects that they'll do this and they do it. Yeah, that's interesting. You should say that actually. A couple, a couple of things that I, I one thing that I wrote down when I was writing some notes is that you said about the golden month in your book that it's is seen in China as being enjoyable and enriching for the yes. mother. Yeah. At that, whereas in our culture, so often what we hear about the postpartum, well, put it this way, we, we if you Google postpartum mm. have you ever done that no ah if you google postpartum like the first five results depression psychosis hemorrhage oh, yeah. and you know anxiety mm. right boom 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 that's the first page of the google search on postpartum yeah. so where in our culture do we see the postpartum as being enjoyable fulfilling enriching healing yeah we don't have that no, no, and the, and actually in Chinese medicine and in one other culture I studied, the Druze, the postpartum is seen not just as a, a moment for recovery and bonding with baby, but also as an opportunity to replenish your long-term health yes. and to repair old trauma, old illness, and this, this is quite, that's why it's called Golden Month. That's right. That's and it, one of the Chinese names for it is Golden Month. And the same in Ayurveda, in Indian tradition, oh. because in Indian tradition it's known as the sacred window. The sacred window. That's yes. right. And so yeah. it's this window of opportunity that yes. you have for exactly the same, of healing old trauma, yeah. healing old illnesses, rejuvenating, but coming out of the postpartum stronger than you were yeah. before you got pregnant. Yes. You'll, you'll, be, you'll come out rejuvenated, but you'll also come out changed in a very positive well. way. And we... We know that you come out changed, don't we, yeah. when you become a mother. It, yeah. On such a deep level, there, there is so much change. And again, our culture doesn't respect that because, as we just spoke about before we turned the camera on, in our culture we've got this thing of bouncing back. Mm. And when we say bouncing back, it's bouncing back to the life that you had before. You became a mother. Yes. As, as though you can go back to how you were before. Yes. You can never go back to how you were before. <laughs> You're a whole different person. Exactly, yeah. And you've got a whole different brain. And this is my fascinating work that I did with Julia, was learning about the you know, um, neuroplasticity of the postpartum yes. and how yes. the brain completely changes. And that's just 
absolutely stunning. The, the work with the oxytocin, and and in Chinese medicine, the the equivalent is as the idea that it's called peak of change, and it's again like a window, and and there are there are a, a four moments when in women's lives where they can change their health, menarc, the period in a very minor way every time you get a period. Um, giving birth and menopause but giving birth is by far the most important really? and intense goal of the golden opportunities yeah and and it, it's really given weight this the whole theory is really given weight um from to from the um oxytocin research which yes. is saying the same thing it's saying the same thing well that's what i love that's what i love what oh, gets me so excited because everything that we know about these postpartum care traditions yeah. And the importance of the care of the new mother and the you know the building of the oxytocin and the rest and the rejuvenation and the opportunity for healing mm. is now being backed up by modern day neuroscience. Yeah. Isn't exactly. that the coolest it thing? It is so cool. I know. It's just like and, and so you know, to extrapolate that on a, a little bit, um it, it, as Jenny writes in her book, she interviews these different women from around the world. And when you interview those women and you see these themes coming through, and we, we looked at them here, these components of good care, yes. you call them. Yeah. And sometimes they call them sort of pillars of the postpartum. Yeah. Let, we, we could go through them briefly. I was almost thinking we could do another interview on them, but let's just mention them because we, we could actually yeah. carry on and do another interview later on. But the first one being the rest. The rest. Of yeah. course, absolutely. Forty crucial. days of rest. Forty days of rest. Yeah. Not. It, it's very important to not feel constrained. Yes. I mean, this one word is confinement in in of old English traditions. That's right. They did call it the confinement. But confinement can also be seen as a space, a held space where you can process. Yes. So it doesn't have to have that connotation of imprisonment. I always think of um, convalescence. You know, convalescence yes, is a nice word too. that we've yeah. that we've lost. But remember how you, you know you'd get ill, or you'd have a big big major trauma, or you, or something big would happen, and you'd be able to convalesce, which just means I always think of convalescence as being just resting with a rug over your knees and mm. sitting in the sunshine. Mm. So it's a very proactive state. Yes, rest in that case is a very proactive state, and that's something that. West, in Western culture, we don't do very well. We're not very good at. It. We don't. No. We don't. Um, you know, consider it important. We're not. We we considering doing, 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 not being. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes I say to my patients, look, think of rest as a job. Yes. And then you can feel proactive about resting, and this is this is your your job now. Yes. Is to rest. But of course, what we don't realise, you know, particularly in the postpartum, I think, is that when we're resting, we're healing. Exactly. Like we might yeah. think we're lying in bed. Doing nothing, you know, doing nothing. A lot of women say, "Oh, yeah, you know, I'm doing nothing all day." Mm. But their bodies are healing from that their marathon that we just talked yeah. about. Eh? That big wound yeah. where the placenta was that, that takes up to six weeks to heal. That's right. The heart output has changed dramatically. It's much, much. Initially, it's higher after birth, and then it goes much lower because you're not supporting the the um, circulation of the placenta and the baby. So that it's like having um, a, a river that's suddenly not flowing as fast, and so the output is much slower. Yeah. So you're more likely to get cold. Um, you, you actually have to allow that whole cardiovascular system to make the change, and that's up to six weeks as well. Yes. And then you've got the cervix and the vagina healing. I mean, they're a little quicker. Sometimes had a, surgery. A I was going to say so surgery, surgery healing stitches. from surgery. Yeah. Um, and the kidneys also are working really hard because as the uterus contracts then all the metabolic wastes from that are being excreted by the kidneys. So the kidneys are working harder than they normally would. Yeah. And then we've got the whole hormonal system. So it's like almost every part of the body is, is really touched by this and, and has to make a major change. Major changes. And then making breast milk as well. And then making breast milk. Which takes yeah. up how, how much of your energy? Is it 25, 20? up to 25% more energy yeah, that you need? That you need to lactate. Yeah. And then go, and you're doing a 24 7 job at the same time, which is getting up all the way through the day and all the way through the night to attend yes. to a little baby who needs yes. you to be present for them. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Rest so, is, rest is really, really important. That's and true. I mean, some of, the, some of the Chinese women here in Auckland have described. Young Chinese women have described their grandmothers coming and saying, "I'll take that cell phone. You're not, yeah. you're not going on social media. You're not looking at your cell phone." But there is actually also in Chinese medicine a reason behind not looking at screens, and that's because we say that. I mean, it sounds a little odd, but it's, 
but but there's a reality a reality to it, and that's that the liver, the the liver, the blood of the liver, um, is influenced by what you do when you read. Yes. So the eyes and the liver have a relationship. So you don't want to strain your eyes at any yeah. point. And I mean, we also know that it takes a lot of energy to engage the brain in reading. It does. And you want to, you want to conserve your energy on every single count. That's right. And um, I mean, that links into what I tell my girls when I do birth education, which is to, when they're going into labour, mm. to to get off the screens because the oxytocin, uh, the neocortex, sorry, the neocortex is stimulated by blue light. Ah. So when you're looking at screens or uh, watching TV or anything like that, then it stimulates the neocortex, which means the oxytocin can't flow. Uh -huh. Because the well, that's, because that's the, a very clear reason that women can take on here. Exactly. Yeah. Apart and also the other thing that happens with um, you know reading screen watch, watching too much many screens and social media is that you you the input of what you're seeing is yes. not sometimes positive. You know no. you can see all the terrible news stories. And actually, that brings us to another really important point, yeah. which is that this is a protected space. Yes. It's an empowered space for, for the mother. It must be an empowered space, but it's also a protected space. It should space. be a sanctuary. It's a sanctuary. It should be a postpartum so sanctuary of peace and beauty yeah. and love and support. Yeah. Yeah. And that not, and all the women I've spoken to from different cultures, they've said, you must be protected from unnecessary bad news. Yes. You, and and gossip. Yes. And oh, really? Think, well, yes. and anything that might might uh, make upset. upset you. Totally. Yeah. Because yeah. And, we, and we know that you know now again neuroscience oxytocin is affected by stress. Of course. Yeah. So our oxytocin of the you know the hormone that we that we want to be flowing to produce the breast milk to fall in love with our babies to have that lovely gooey snuggly feeling. Mm. That we that we which is our reward, right? For yeah. having the baby, it's our reward. Yes. Is it impacted by stress? And so that's another good reason. I remember actually a funny story. I had a client. Um, I wrote a blog post about it called "President Trump Stole My Breast Milk," <laughs> <laughs> and it was about the fact that I had a client who I went to visit, and she was struggling with breastfeeding. You know, and the mm. baby. You know, I can't remember. She didn't think she had enough milk and whatever was happening with the breastfeeding but it was just around the time of the election and I oh, went around there and the news was on you know or it was on the radio or something yeah. like this and she was telling me all about this breastfeeding issues and you know how she wasn't producing enough milk and she was really struggling and then she looked at the television and she was like and then that man is just on the television the whole time and um, you know it's devastating and I was like hang on you need to turn off the television <laughs> <laughs> I was like because I think President Trump is stealing your breast milk. <laughs> that's lovely. <laughs> so yeah, that's you don't story. want President Trump or any other bad no, you things don't want in your little sanctuary. And and it's it's very important, of course, that you know important things aren't kept from you course, either. Yeah. It's a matter of respect, but but it, it is really important that idea of cultivating a beautiful sanctuary. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I that's what I say to my mums as well. You know, how do you want to feel? How do you want your environment to feel? Yeah. And how can we create that? Yes. You know? And it's yeah. uh, well not actually it's not their job, it's my job as their yeah. doula and their their community. Yeah. yeah. Now yeah. you just touched on the next thing as well when you said the kidneys were you know working really hard and that could make you cold. That's uh, the no, next no, thing. Sorry, the output of the heart. Sorry, yes, the output the of the heart. heart. Yeah. Um. So in in yes in, in Chinese medicine we say that most women are relatively cold and deficient after yeah. after this massive effort that they've made. And therefore, every effort must be made to keep them warm, to give them warm food. Well, yeah. that's our next one. But um, to, to do massage, which is amazing for the circulation, and pretty much goes with rest because there's an issue of when the heart output is low, is that, okay, what's your circulation doing? Your circulation is slow. That's right. So how to avoid thrombosis? Yes. How, to, how to avoid circulatory problems? Massage. Correct. It's actually the perfect passive exercise. It is. And it, you look at all other cultures, rest is accompanied by massage. Sometimes or daily. Yes. Day, in Indonesia, yes. a daily massage for India 30 days. As well. India as yeah. well. And yeah. didn't you say in Mali as well? Mali as well, yep. Daily so massage, yeah. Imagine, you know, the massage, yeah, the massage therapist comes every day for 30 or 40 days and get, get yeah. massage for as long as you want. Mm. And that's just, and that's not a luxury. No. It's no, a it's a necessity. necessity. And, and it was interesting because last year there was published in one of the nursing journals some research about um, the dangers perhaps of 
this idea of lying in. I saw that, yes, yes that, that it could increase the rate of DVT or yes. whatever. Yeah, exactly. But the, the problem with the article was that it didn't actually take any account of what else the women were doing. Yeah. And I think that the, the researchers would have found that if there would be, have been something working on the circulation. If not massage, then it would have been some kind of application of warmth. Yes. Um, like in different countries, hot towels, hot stones. Yeah. Vaginal steams. Yeah. 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 And anything that's also warming the body. Um, yeah, so in that case, you know, the research needed to go a bit further because what they were really doing was ringing alarm bells about um, traditions that, that know that the circulation is slower and know what to do. Correct. And Correct. Herbal medicine also, you know, properly given, properly prescribed, is going to also improve your circulation. That's so right, as as yeah. will the foods that are given as, as well. As well the foods, you yeah. know. Um, but, the, but the keeping warm theme goes across yeah. all the cultures. All the cultures. Even, Even culture. hot, hot countries. Yes. Yeah. They still, I remember our friends of mine in, you know, in Indian cultures said that they still had to wear their socks and their hat when it was 30 degrees <laughs> but and they, but that, you know, that was very important there was no drafts around mm, and no drafts like that's a very common theme yeah, yeah that's right and then um the next theme is the food what so yeah. what kind of food do they recommend in traditional chinese so, medicine well in traditional chinese medicine it's very much food that not is only physically warm but that has a warming energy so certain types in chinese medicine i think avid it's the same yeah. certain types of food have a more warming energy, but it's really made precise that it mustn't be hot energy. Yes, yeah, not spicy, warm. eh? So yeah. not spicy, but warming, and so things not to, that are physically warm, of course, but also warming type foods, so chicken soup. Yeah. Um, um, root vegetables are good. Um, and they have been too, it's like sweet, the sweet energy is a little bit important The sweet too, energy, yeah. but not excessive. No, which, not sugary, but no. things like sweet potato, sweet and, potato you know, yeah. yam and carrots and things like yeah. that. Yeah, and those also pertain to earth in Chinese medicine, ah. so you're nourishing earth as well. Yes, and easily and digestible as well as the, the other, isn't thing. it? Yeah. yeah, easily digestible, which means that it's supporting the functions of stomach and spleen and earth energy in Chinese medicine. So, and, and same with Ayurveda, they say that the digestive system is, is weakened, so yeah. that you you know that that to eat cold or raw food would, would create more. You have to expend more energy. Yes, and in, and and it's seen even further in Chinese medicine that if you eat cold food, it's actually going to stagnate in the lower part of your yeah. body, and therefore it's going to inhibit the proper expulsion of the lochia. Right. And the same if you eat too much sour food, the same as stringing was a different kind of process, but that would be a stringing. And that will also stop the proper processing of the lochia, the yeah. discharge. And if food is too hot, the blood becomes reckless, we say, and then you can get excessive bleeding yeah. and also excessive sweating. So it's very important to just be, yeah, be precise that the food must be gentle on the digestion, supportive and warm. And made by someone else. And made by someone else, <laughs> yes, yes. With yes, love. Yes. With love, because... Yeah. Because that's a vital ingredient. It is. That it is. And again, mm. all of those cross-cultural. I remember in your book you were talking about Mali and the uh, uh, African countries. The women are given chicken soup as well. Mm. Aren't they? Chicken soup seems to be a theme in the country. Chicken soup each everywhere. Other. Remember yeah. one of my old clients was from Ecuador, I think, and they. Uh, well, I can't remember what they. It was called. Was it La Dienta? La, La Dieta? The the quarantena or. No, it was a different name, but it was the forty days. Mm. And, uh, but she said to me, if I had to see another bowl of chicken soup, <laughs> I said, yeah. she said, I was given it three times a day. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. No, that's a bit much. But, uh, Actually, that, I'm glad you brought that up because um, in Chinese medicine, there, there is a kind of a, yeah, a caveat that goes with chicken soup, and that is that it, it's because you want a nutrient-rich diet, of yes. course, for cell repair. It's actually important that you don't overburden the digestion with too much too much um, rich or or too much um, protein. Right. So, so, so if, if someone if, if if the mother wakes up after two days of chicken soup and says, "I don't feel like chicken yeah. soup," that must be respected yeah, because her digestion is telling her, mm, "I've okay. had enough for now. Yeah. Let's have something a bit lighter." Or, I mean, chicken soup is digestible, especially if you know it's cooked correctly. Yeah. But again, it's. Yeah, it's nutrient rich, so it's a concentrated form of protein. Yes, yes. So you do have to, yeah, be respectful of that. Sorry, I'm just off. And 
Jenny has amazing recipes for chicken soup in here. So that's, yeah, so that's, that's good to know. Um, and also the other thing I say to my, because I love cooking for my clients. That's one of the things that I do. I love cooking. I love food. Um, but, you know, women come from different cultural backgrounds and, and different scenarios. So I often say to them, I, I, I share with them the guidelines for the food, you know, that ideally it's warm and, uh, and nutrient dense and things like that. But then I say, well, just tell me something that you love. Tell me yeah. something that makes you your comfort food. What's your comfort food? What did your grandmother make for you? Mm. Because when you cook something like that, that that triggers that part of the love part of the brain. Yes. Then yes. that increases oxytocin, and of it makes course. feels feel you know. So if it is macaroni cheese or or something comforting now and then, mm. that's okay. Absolutely. And, and if they're yeah. dying for a bowl of ice cream and it's thirty five degrees outside, then it's, you know yeah, it's not one day of ice cream is not going to exactly. Do it. It's really important. That's a really important aspect. Of it goes back to what you were mm. saying about being constricted. You don't want to be constricted. No, you want, no, to, you feel want to feel empowered. That's right. And the other thing, actually, I was thinking when you said that too, is that the oxytocin research also shows that when you eat with people that you trust and love, yes. and you sit around and eat together, then everyone generates oxytocin. Isn't that lovely? Mm. I so, love that. Yeah. And yeah. I feel, although this probably hasn't been researched, that when you cook for someone and feed them, yes. That produces oxytocin. Yes, There's something that's lovely about you know yeah. being there to serve somebody delicious food. And I tell you what, new mums are the most grateful people. I think so. <laughs> they're so, hungry. They're so grateful. You they're know, so hungry. Because, yeah, they're so hungry and it's just so nice. And I remember myself, I don't know, you, know, you probably remember when your mum, this, yes. this is the thing about postpartum, and, I, and with that brain plasticity, I can trouble to say that, you remember when people care for you, don't you? Yes, absolutely. The simplest little yeah. things. When people you know, give you a bowl of soup or cuddle the baby while you eat it. Or yeah. I remember a, a, a friend of mine just knocking on the door and saying, do you want me to take the baby around the block while you eat your lunch oh. and have a nap? Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, thank you. You know, I've yeah. never forgotten that little no, thing. No, no, no. So that feeling of being loved is so yeah. important. And actually that goes to our next point. So we've covered the rest, the massage, the diet, the community and the support, the village support. Yeah, and, and that, that, that this is the vital ingredient because yeah. you can't do any of it without no. the support. And this is where we come to the, the, what we've been talking about too is the, the sense of empowerment that women must have is they do a postpartum that suits them. And for some women, having a postpartum in a very prescribed way and, you know, strong containers, yeah. that suits them and that's part of their tradition and... and the strength of ritual is very powerful yes, and yes. for them that's going to be the best thing but for other women um, they don't want to feel constrained and, yeah. and then in that case it's very very important that they um, they put together themselves what they want for their postpartum with the knowledge of what's going on in their bodies yes. and with an awareness that they need to tune into themselves yes. and that they need to be aware of that outside kind of narrative of let's get back into the skinny jeans yeah. and let's get going because that's so strong and powerful. It's so powerful and it's so destructive. And it, it's so destructive and it stops women tuning in. Yeah, it does. It so does. I think when women tune in, they need to be aware of that narrative and they need to be aware, very much aware of the facts of the postpartum around what their body's doing yeah. and then tune in. That's yeah. quite empowering, I think, isn't it, to yeah. understand because that narrative that I was just saying to you earlier that even I had it, you know, 20 years ago, I the days before mm -hmm. social media, now with social media it's almost worse. You've got that Instagram feed, which, you know, mm -hmm. women that have just given birth and their mm -hmm. midriff jeans and this bouncing back kind of culture. But even mm -hmm. 20 years ago, I, I remember priding myself on going out for lunch with my baby when he was, you know, I just got home from the hospital after having a C-section. And mm. somebody saying to me, oh, you look so great, I can't believe you're out already. And thinking that that was some kind of achievement. Yes. Whereas and now yeah, I look back and the think, trap. what was I doing? I was crazy. Mm. Yeah, that's right, that's the trap. Feeling as though you're, you, you've you kind of achieved something. Yeah. Um, and not having that cultural tradition of saying, no, you should be in bed resting for six weeks. Mm. But when you explain this to a woman about, about the aspects of healing, the physiological aspects of healing, mm. uh, the postpartum, and the benefits to the rest, and the benefits yeah. to being cared for, yeah. then they begin to get it. But then, you, in my experience, you've got a, still a huge boundary to get yes. over. And guess what it is? Yeah. Asking for help. <laughs> Asking for help. 
we yeah, love. it's this feeling that we that it's hard for us to be anything but independent. Yeah. That we're we told can't. that we should be, eh? Yeah. We were just talking earlier about yeah. the you know, fourth wave feminism. We're so lucky to live in the world that we do now with the rights that we have as women and for so long we yeah. had to fight for. Uh, and we, we know now that girls can do anything, right? Yeah. Absolutely. But not everything. But we shouldn't have to do everything. Mm. Exactly. Mm. And being part of a human, being a human being is to be interdependent. Yeah. We know that. That's where we, where we prosper when we're interdependent. That's where we prosper, yeah. You know? But of yeah. course we don't have our village. We don't have our village. We have, to, we have to educate those around us and we have to create our village. Yes. And, and, and the, there has to be also a change inside us about, um, obviously, people that we trust, that, that we can be dependent on. Yes. And it translates practically as well, that if a friend says, I'm going to bring you food, you actually need to know when, yeah. what days, and what time. And tell them the kind of food that you might like, yeah. so yeah. that they don't bring cupcakes or yeah. ice cream. You yeah, know, or, yeah. You, it's, it, so that you need to be... The mother needs to be in control at that time. Right, and we struggle with that on a number of different levels, eh? Mm. Because we struggled to think it's it's being vulnerable. Yeah. Say, oh yes, I'm yeah. not. I you know I need help in this situation. Yeah. Um. It's just it's we don't want to bother people. No. no. We don't want to feel like we're being needy or, or demanding. No, needy needy is is quite a derogatory term. It is. And it doesn't have to be because actually we are needy at this moment and right. we should be. Because, and as I often explain to, to a woman, we're not meant to be bringing up a baby by ourselves. No. It's too many jobs. It's, yeah. it's a 24-7 job to look after yeah. a newborn baby. It goes all the way through the day, and then it goes all the way through the night, and then it goes all the way through the next day, and all the way through the next night. There's no mm. break. Mm. So we have to be looked after. Newborn babies are designed to be looked after by a group of people, yeah. or at least the family yeah, unit. The family, yeah. At least a small group of people, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And I, I was recently in Bali and, and, and staying in a, a small village in Bali and you can just see it there where all the houses are connected with each other and the, the kids are all running around in between houses and mm. somebody's always holding somebody else's baby, breastfeeding somebody else's baby in some situations. Mm. And that's how communities have always worked, haven't they? So our challenge is actually is to become more community-minded, but also, I mean, there's... there's we have to have words with governments. Um, yes. In Northern Europe, people have very, very good postpartum packages. Yes. Where both the father and the mother get it, uh, up to a year, I think, in some countries. Yes, in Scandinavia, is yeah, that right? Scandinavia, yeah. And so, I mean... And then we have the United States, where women have no maternity leave at all. Yeah, paid. not on a national level. Yeah. One extreme to the other. Yeah. And very little support, I don't know. Yeah. And, and, of course, as you and I have talked about in the past, We've got a crisis postpartum. And Absolutely. Currently yeah. in Australasia, the highest maternal mortality is suicide. <gasps> that is, mm. you know, that yeah. is just devastating. And postpartum mood disorders up to twenty percent. Twenty percent. Twenty percent. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think we're failing mothers on, in our cult, you know, in our culture yeah. by not acknowledging and revering this incredibly yeah. important time. Absolutely, and I think. It ha- it needs to happen at a family level of changing the family culture around w- women feeling that this is their entitlement, this is their moment to be treated like queen. Yes. And then it has to happen also at a government level. Yes, absolutely. It's got to radiate out, doesn't it? Because I truly believe, as I know you do, that when you know, a mother and a baby are born into a place of, of respect and love and nurturing and mm. healing, mm. then that, you know, that resonates out into their family. Mm. Absolutely. Out into their community. Absolutely. And out into the world. Yeah. And then we change the world. You yeah. know, one mother and baby at a time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think we're just about out of time <laughs> now, Jen. Is, that, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Um, no, I think I, I think probably just to leave with this this feeling of it. when, I mean, it was so wonderful interviewing all these different women from different cultures around the world. Oh, I can't really I wait to hear more about that. <laughs> yeah. But I think that the thing I went away with was, was just the pride that these women have in their culture. Yes. And the, and the wonderful sense of entitlement that, yes, this is my moment. This, I ask for it. And then later, when my children are a bit older, I'll pass it I'm on. part of this team helping someone else. So it's, yeah, it's rolling right. on. It's interesting how you say entitlement. Eh? It's, it's a word that we don't 
you know, we don't feel entitled. That's part of that thing. I don't deserve yeah. this. I don't yeah. deserve to be asking for this help. Yeah. But when you feel entitled because it's part of your cultural it's tradition. It's not a question of deserving or not. You're entitled. That's yeah. what it is. And you're told the importance of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant, Jenny. Thank you so much. I've <laughs> so you. enjoyed chatting with you. Um, and if you would like to find out more about Jenny's amazing book, this is a beautiful, little, delicious little golden <laughs> book about the golden month. And um, I can't wait for your next book to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my dear. Thank you. <laughs>